Okay, hello everyone. Uh, good evening and welcome. My name is Denise and I am the representative of Pure Encapsulations here in Hong Kong. I would like to extend a warm welcome to all our clinicians joining us tonight. Um, before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone that this is a live webinar, so I encourage you all to take this opportunity to ask questions, um, and you can do that by submitting them uh, anytime during the presentation or even after the, uh, the Q&A box to your right-hand side. Today, it is our honor to be joined by Dr. Barry Ritz. Dr. Ritz is the Chief Scientific Officer at Atrium Innovation. He is a member of the American Society for Nutritional Sciences and serves on the Executive Board of the Council for Responsible Nutrition's Medical Affairs Subcommittee. A former professor at Drexel University, Dr. Ritz is an expert in nutritional immunology and has numerous publications in scientific journals. Today, Dr. Ritz will be taking us through polyphenols, where he will help translate the research and evidence of these powerful nutrients so that we can effectively use them in our clinical practices. So without further delay, I will now pass the following time to Dr. Barry Ritz. Thank you, Denise. Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for sharing your time uh, with me, with us uh, today. Um, really, my objective overall is to talk to you about the research investments and efforts of peer encapsulations and how we translate research um, into clinically effective and safe uh, products for your use. Um, but more specifically, I'm going to share some of our discoveries in polyphenols research and speak a bit about polyphenols, a new emerging area of nutritional medicine. Um, and I'm going to focus in on neurocognitive health because our newest results are in the area of memory in polyphenol science and talk about how we've applied this specific polyphenols research to the development of evidence-based um, clinical approaches to um, memory. So as Denise mentioned, I mean, she, she gave a very nice introduction, but I thought I'll expand on that a little bit. As she said, my background, uh, my name is Barry Ritz, and my background is in nutritional immunology, um, and I'm the chief science officer at Pure Encapsulation. So what does that mean? Uh, it means that I have the, well, first of all, I have the best job. Um, I get to be involved in the innovation and the new product development and oversee how we take the science and apply it to new um, therapeutic tools for you. Um, I also uh, have the privilege of overseeing any clinical trials um, investments that we make globally. Um, and then I'm also responsible for the regulatory side, at least in North America, so how we uh, label our products and represent them in the marketplace. Um, it's never fair when you're doing a webinar, I think. Uh, you don't see the person, um, and I, I, it's okay that I don't see you, but since I'm doing a lot of talking, I put my picture there, and that's me with um, Albert Einstein in the background, uh, just outside of the National Academies of Science uh, building in Washington, D.C. a few weeks ago. So you can at least see uh, what I look like while I'm speaking to you. And um, I want to recognize, I mean, obviously, I put some slides together uh, to, for our time together, but there are many people involved um, in both the research and um, distilling the research into a, a, a clear message that I can share with you today. So just some of the collaborators and contributors that make this webinar possible I've listed there. Um, Dr. Kelly Heim, um, who works closely with us as a nutritional pharmacologist and educator. Um, the researchers behind the polyphenols work we've done, Yves Desjardins, ben, Benoit Lamarche, Helen Schock. Um, and also, as a researcher, um, I thought it would be nice to share some clinical perspective with you. Um, and since I, you know, I'm not a clinician, I don't work with patients directly, as you, as you may. Um, I did uh, receive a, a case study from a, a, a customer and a collaborator, Pam McDonald, and I thought I'd share that with you today as well. So just um, to start off, I think taking a very high-level view um, of aging and, 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 the, and the process, um, it's obviously a multifactorial process that's driven either towards a healthy response, one that we could, we could consider normal aging, or towards dysregulation than the chronic diseases of aging, um, things like vascular dysfunction, uh, metabolic syndrome, um, 
cognitive decline. So our objective must be to drive that physiology towards healthful outcomes based on the presence or absence of the right stimuli. So the topic of our discussion today, again, is one such stimulus, bioactive polyphenols. So what are polyphenols? Polyphenols are a structural class of organic compounds characterized by large numbers of phenolic groups, a phenyl ring attached to a hydroxyl group, as, as shown here in the bottom right corner, um, just that's you know, from a chemical structure perspective. Those hydroxyl groups um, have strong antioxidant scavenging, uh, antioxidant activity, um, which is, uh, I think polyphenols have been pigeonholed or, 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 or um, put in the category of antioxidants, but um, hopefully our talk, our time together today convinces you that polyphenols are much, much more than antioxidants. Um, as bioactive constituents of fruits, vegetables, tea, red wine, um, there are over 8,000 polyphenol compounds identified to date, um, and we know little about their health benefits. So it's, a, it's an area um, of, of emerging science and great opportunity for investment in nutritional science and, and learning more about the compounds within fruits and vegetables um, that, that contribute to their health, um, health benefits. Polyphenols are nearly ubiquitous in the leaves, stems, bark, and fruits of plants, and the purpose that they serve in the plant is to offer protection from disease, injury, um, environmental stresses. Um, they provide things like astringent taste to deter uh, plant eaters. They have my antimicrobial activity. They, they, heal, they allow the plant to heal from injury. Um, they're involved in the stress response. Um, and Luckily for us, they contribute to the color and the taste of these foods. So um, we talk about the concept of eating a rainbow. Um, polyphenols are, are responsible for our ability to do just that. Um, just for fun, the picture I chose on the right side there is um, Bordeaux grapes. Remember that those are Bordeaux grapes. That's important to uh, our conversation later. Um, so it just, just some background on that. So the damp vineyard conditions where these particular grapes grow um, are, are um, subject to yeast growth. So one of the challenges with growing grapes, particularly in this region, is the possibility of, grease, of yeast overgrowth. So as a result, these particular grapes generate large quantities of a polyphenol group called still beans. Um, an example of a still bean is resveratrol that you may be familiar with, and these are polyphenols that protect the grapes from yeast. Um, so they're anti-yeast, um, antimicrobials that help protect these grapes from their common uh, enemy, which is yeast. So other grape varietals and other environmental conditions in other parts of the world would not necessarily have the same polyphenol content. So a grape is not a grape is not a grape when it comes to their polyphenol makeup. So. Not all fruits are created equal when it comes to polyphenols and their potential health benefits. That's the point I wanted to make. Polyphenols, um, you know, what makes them really interesting regarding their health benefits is how versatile they are. So polyphenols exhibit a broad spectrum of effects. Um, neurocognitive, as we'll talk about today, insulin signaling we'll talk about today, um, endothelial function we'll talk about today, but also an immune function, lipid metabolism, cell cycle regulation, and of course, as I said, antioxidant and detoxification pathways. So, you know, why this is so interesting, you know, a drug is often has a single target or supposed to, um, that it binds with high affinity. And, and even vitamins, you know, are, are, have a higher affinity. They're, they're, they're designated to perform, you know, a limited set of functions. Um, they're going to have a broader um, function than a drug necessarily. Often, they're going to have, you know, there are going to be different cells in different parts of the body where they participate um, as cofactors in reactions, things like that. But their, their effects are generally somewhat limited. But dietary polyphenols bind molecular targets with low affinity, low selectivity. They serve a lot of different functions. So the result of that is that they have a lot of different effects, but also that they're, they have, but the result is low toxicity. So. What's beautiful about polyphenols is the opportunity to explore diverse health benefits with compounds that are very safe, low toxicity. And numerous epidemiological and interventional studies clearly show, uh, demonstrate the diverse health benefits of polyphenol, dietary polyphenols. So just to illustrate quickly how the, these thousands of compounds are classified, um, 
these are terms I'm sure you've seen and come across uh, previously, flavonoids, I mentioned still beans already. Um, most of what we're talking about today in focusing on berry extracts, and particularly the berry extracts that we've chosen to study in our own clinical research program at Pure Encapsulations, involves the class called flavonoids, and more specifically, catechins and anthocyanins, um, as well as the uh, PACs, the proanthocyanidins, um, the OPCs that you find in grapeseed and cranberry. So again, of the 8,000 known compounds in the plant kingdom, the known polyphenol compounds, um, they're not all in the human diet, and we really don't know much about most of them. The human diet probably uh, estimates, depending on the, on the source that you look at, contains maybe 1,000 polyphenols, and they're mostly the flavonoids and tannins. Um, but again, underways, uh, efforts are underway to better understand the polyphenol contents of our foods. It's an underappreciated aspect of our diet, and the work continues to better understand the importance of polyphenols in our diet. So our own research um, program, we decided to focus on three main areas um, to look at, again, not just dietary polyphenols, but use of polyphenol extracts for specific clinical outcomes. And these are in the area of vascular function or blood flow, insulin sensitivity, and memory. And I'll touch on the first two and spend a good bit of time on the third. And as I mentioned, uh, this I, I said this basically with the um, Bordeaux grape illustration, but there are many variables that contribute to the polyphenol content of a given food or, 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 or source, like the growing conditions, location, uh, time of har harvest, et cetera. But also the genetics and microbiome of the host are going to impact the absorption, metabolism, elimination, and ultimately the therapeutic response. So, you know, when we're studying the potential therapeutic benefits of polyphenols and, you know, are with an intention of conducting well-designed, controlled clinical trials, it's really necessary to know, you know, which polyphenols are we testing, what are the metabolites involved, because for the most part, we're not going to get into this in great detail tonight, but you know, you consume a polyphenol compound, it's quite large, it gets metabolized, the metabolites are active um, in the physiological response. So tying those metabolites um, to the specific clinical outcomes. Um, you know, the research like what we have done, um, sure, it contributes, I think, to a general understanding of polyphenols and a recommendation for polyphenol-rich diets, the eat a rainbow concept. Uh, polyphenols are generally um, positive, you know, attributes of a healthful diet, but the specific clinical outcomes that I'll discuss with you tonight can only be assigned to the specific polyphenol extract, extract doses and the patient populations that we've studied. In other words, ingredient-specific research is important and necessary in order to advance uh, this field of science. If you're targeting a specific clinical outcome or mechanism, you have to consider the exact chemical composition, bioavailability, and metabolism of the polyphenol extracts you're studying, which is what we've done. So again, I'm going to get into our own research um, and the approach we've ta taken in developing polyphenol extracts as therapeutic agents for your use. Um, we start with in vitro studies. Um, try, you know, looking at the potential uh, interaction of different polyphenol compounds with different um, cell signaling activities um, or, or in cellular models. Um, then we move to pre other preclinical models, as I'll discuss in some detail, and ultimately we select polyphenol extracts that we think are best suited for the uh, clinical target of interest, and we move on to uh, ultimately to human clinical trials. So again, these are the three areas where we've concentrated most of our polyphenol work to date, metabolic health, vascular function, and neurocognitive health, and I'll, I'll talk about our results in each of these areas. So the, uh, the first I, I, I chose to, to um, discuss is metabolic health. Um, in this area, um, working with subjects with metabolic syndrome, or um, in this case, pre-diabetic subjects, we demonstrated um, in a publication, this is from last year, uh, British Journal of Nutrition, 2017, that a combination of Orlean strawberry, and I specify that because a strawberry is not a strawberry is not a strawberry, so we work with some specific strawberry varietal um, from Ile d'Orlean, which is off the coast of Quebec City in uh, Canada, uh, which was particularly rich in some 
uh, polyphenols of interest, and um, we were able to measure uh, some of the uh, metabolites um, coming from that, like ferulic acid, which seemed to contribute specifically to some of our results. So a combination of orlean strawberry and cranberry extracts um, at 300 milligrams of polyphenols from these extracts per day for six weeks. And this was a, a medium-sized study, but very well-designed, 40, 41 subjects, pre-diabetic subjects, so healthy subjects, but on the road towards type 2 diabetes. Um, and what we observed in just six weeks was a really remarkable um, outcome, 21% improvement in insulin sensitivity compared to the control group. Actually, if you look at the data closely, the study group receiving the strawberry cranberry polyphenols, which we call glucophenol for short, um, responded uh, positively in terms of improving insulin sensitivity and some other uh, markers in response to oral glucose tolerance tests, et cetera while the placebo group actually got a little bit worse in the course of the six weeks. So the differential between the improvement and the decline in the placebo group was a 21% superiority in the glucophenol group. We also saw an, an early compensatory increase in insulin secretion in response to an oral glucose challenge. Um, and overall, um, you know, the outcome of taking all the, the parameters together was improved, improved glucose homeostasis, improved insulin sensitivity in these pre-diabetic subjects in just two weeks. And that means, you know, can we use polyphenols to help delay or even halt the progression um, towards type 2 diabetes? Again, we were really blown away with these results. We thought, my goodness, these are, this is a strawberry extract, and we're seeing this kind of an impact um, on, on blood insulin and glucose response. Another area we've studied is in vascular health or blood flow. We looked at flow-mediated dilation. You might be familiar with that measurement. It's, a, it's also called FMD for short, a surrogate marker for endothelial function or brachi brach brachial artery dimension um, used to approximate changes in blood flow. So there are many publications using FMD um, as a marker, as a, as a surrogate marker for endothelial function and blood flow. Um, usually in subjects that are um, non-healthy populations. So in subjects with cardiovascular disease, looking at um, influence on vascular function and blood flow in those subjects. But we were actually interested in looking at the effects of high-dose PAC, poly, poly, um, paranthocyanidin, um, rich polyphenol extracts um, on blood flow in um, a healthy population. And we chose elite athletes because actually we did this in conjunction with some, um, with a, a group from you know, the Olympic side, where we were looking at Olympic athletes, particularly ski, ski skaters, um, and one of the challenges in that sport is, um, is sort of because of the stance and the speed of the event is in blood flow. So that was our population of choice, but it allowed us to look at um, a healthy population instead of a diseased population to understand what the effects of poly, acute effects of polyphenols could be in blood flow. Um, and we observed a really remarkable 2.8% increase in FMD at 60 minutes. 2.8% does not sound large, but if you consider that that's across the entire vasculature of the body, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a very significant um, actual physiological effect. And it's similar in effect size to what's been seen um, with agents like arginine in subjects with cardiovascular disease. But again, this is with uh, grape seed and cranberry uh, in, healthy, in a healthy population. So we were really impressed with those results as well. Moving on to neurocognitive health, um, I'm going to spend the most time here. We, uh, we, we did a, a literature review and identified there's plenty of epidemiological work um, suggesting um, benefits to polyphenol, at least dietary polyphenols, and cognitive outcomes. So we started with a strong thesis that we would see something, the nurses' health study, a study of 122,000 uh, nurses, and, and with, uh, within that population, and looking at 16,000 nurses beginning um, at the ages of 30 to 55, they observed over um, a period of time in this, um, in this study that those who consumed the most blueberries and strawberries um, seemed to have the least amount of memory decline uh, as they aged. So there was, there was a lot of sort of background, this kind of work, um, that suggested to us that we were going to see some sort of benefit. So we entered something called the Neurophenols Project, um, which is a French-Canadian collaborative. 
Um, so there were multiple academic and commercial commercial partners. We were one of them. We were the we were the group bringing the um, actual study product um, into the uh, into the mix. And um, but we had partners that were working on the extract of fruits and um, in vitro and preclinical study models, as well as again the academic partners um, who primarily were from. French, France, and Canada. So it was a, a group out of the University of Bordeaux in France and uh, at uh, Laval University in Quebec in Canada. Um, so it was a, a number of partners coming together with one unified aim, which was to develop an effective natural product for memory support in older individuals and to do that by um, studying the potential application of polyphenols uh, from small fruits. So again, ultimately, we brought together grapes from the Bordeaux region and blueberries from Canada um, to create what the, the, the extract that we worked with, which we call neurophenol, um, to make it simple. So the neurophenol was a combination of blueberry extract and grape extract. And this shows here just on the slide some of the um, characterization of the polyphenol um, compounds within that extract, very rich, as I had said earlier, in PAC, proanthocyanidins, um, flavanols, um, phenolic acids, um, catechins, epicatechins. Um, grapes, in particular, are rich in still beans um, and flavanols, and the blueberries um, contributing the PAC and phenolic acids. So this, this neurophenol blend was, of course, fully characterized to understand exactly what we were working with. Um, I'm not going to be able to go through all of it, but we did a number of in vitro studies on the individual and combined um, extracts, um, and then we moved as well into uh, preclinical studies, including in animal models. Some of the data shown here, um, this was looking at targeted um, metabol metabol met metabolomic profiling in the plasma and feces. Um, 15 days after supplementation with the blueberry extract or the grape extract or their combination as neurophenol, um, looking at changes in plasma concentration of the metabolites. Um, and this particular data that's, that's shown here is um, illustrating one of the outcomes, which was seen that there was a synergistic benefit between grape and blueberry um, consumed together as opposed to individually. So there was an intera positive interaction between the two uh, sources of polyphenols in which the grape extract actually enhanced the absorption of the blueberry uh, phenolic compounds, uh, which was really interesting, and, and this is um, some published work. We conducted several studies uh, to pinpoint the potential mechanisms of action. Um, for example, in adult mice, the data shown here is the animal data from mice. I mean, adult aged mice, older mice, uh, we observed um, an 8% increase in neuronal growth factor, uh, which of course promotes cholinergic nerve function and supports spatial memory and other, other uh, domains. Um, BDNF, 54% uh, in these animals, that's brain-derived neurotrophic trophic factor. You've probably heard something about that. It's, it's a very interesting uh, mechanistic target for nutritional as well as drug um, interventions. CAM, um, Kinase 2 involved in the signaling cascade related to memory increased 12% in these animals. And the phenolic metabolites were positively correlated with memory performance in these animals. Further preclinical trials were conducted. Um, this is demonstrating the um, gold standard model um, in preclinical work to look at spatial memory in young and old animals. So mice, um, this is the more, it's called the Morris water maze. Um, if, I'm not sure if you've seen this before, but basically um, mice are put into a swimming pool, small pool, um, and there's a, a platform that they can stand on that's just under the surface of the water. So it's hidden under the surface of the water so that the mice can't find it right away. So you put them in, they swim around in the pool until they find the platform where they can comfortably stand and stop swimming. And if you put a young mouse into the same pool a second time, they remember where that platform is and they swim right over to it, whereas older mice um, may forget where the platform is and wander around, as this red dotted line suggests, 
um, for a little uh, for a while longer before they find that platform. A really kind of simple model, but very well used and validated over many many years and many studies um, to understand um, differences between young and aged performance when it comes to spatial memory. And then, and just to jump to the <clears throat> conclusion, mice, mice receiving the polyphenol extracts remembered uh, where the platform was more easily. So there was an improvement in spatial memory um, in uh, both young and old animals um, when they were consuming the neurophenol polyphenol blend um, prior to this, this swimming test. Similarly, uh, recognition memory. Um, you know, mice are curious about new objects, so a mouse is presented with two similar objects um, and then presented with a novel object, so something that looks different. Um, you know, the mice, once they become familiar with the original object, they're not so curious anymore, and when, when you introduce a new object, um, the amount of time the mouse spends exploring that new object compared to the familiar object is used to measure recognition memory. So the younger mouse would recognize their, the, the thing they did before and spend more of their time looking at the new object, whereas an old mouse might sort of explore um, the old and the new together uh, because they have uh, less of a memory of having recognized the first um, object. So in, in our study, neurophenol supplementation for 12 weeks in old mice um, supported better performance on this uh, test of recognition memory compared to controls as well. All of these results have been published. So moving on to the clinical trial, uh, with all of that work behind us, we engaged in a large randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial of memory performance in healthy older adults. Um, this was a bi-center trial, so we conducted half of the clinical intervention in Quebec, um, and half in France, but they were all receiving the same neurophenol blend, 300 milligrams, or placebo twice daily for six months. And ultimately, we enrolled 204 subjects, you know, approximately 100 at each of the two sites, and again, for six months. Um, of course, you know, all the normal uh, inclusion-exclusion criteria, polyphenol-rich foods were restricted um, during the course of this study, um, number of berries that they were allowed to consume, um, limiting the amount of tea, dark chocolate, uh, wine, et cetera, that could be consumed and contribute to dietary polyphenol content. The primary outcome um, that we targeted for this was episodic memory um, using a very well validated battery of tests called the Cambridge Neuropsychological um, Automated Battery. Um, it's a reliable neurocognitive exam um, consisting of tests of memory, learning, attention, problem solving, executive function. This is where they were, you know, these are mostly computer tests where you sit down with a screen and the subject, you know, goes through the different games um, and, the, and, and their, you know, how they perform their, you know, their scores and things is used to um, make determinations of the different aspects of memory. It's, again, very well validated um, testing mechanism. Uh, for looking at age-associated changes in cognitive function, including among non-cognitive non, uh, impaired subjects. So, you know, again, our subjects were older with maybe some mild age-associated cognitive impairment. These were, these were healthy subjects, not um, diagnosed with dementia, for example. Um, so, again, uh, paired associates learning was the primary outcome, and the uh, secondary uh, was a uh, VRM or verbal recognition memory, verbal re recall, um, which is related to the you know ability to recall um, words, for example. So I'll show you some of those tests in a little more detail. Um, episodic memory, you know, memory is made up of there memory. There are multiple types of memory that can be studied, and we have to um, differentiate, you know, through different um, cognitive functioning um, through these different tests. So episodic memory. Um, or autobiographical memory um, is things like the ability to recall people, places, and things from your past. So it would be, um, you know, some details of an important event in your life that may have happened many years before, or what you had for dinner um, when you were out with your uh, spouse or uh, friend a few nights ago. Um, and these are aspects of memory that that do that have been um, demonstrated to decline relatively quickly compared to other cognitive functioning, um, you know, with, with quote-unquote normal aging. 
So in assessing episodic memory, you know, the number of errors that you make on these tests would typically increase with age as is shown here in the graph. So as the age increases along the x-axis, um, the number of errors in the, um, the computer test that is used to assess this would increase. So this is just the typical age to error um, average that we see across you know, many, many studies that have been done in this area. So again, quote unquote, normal um, aging is expected to see an increase um, in errors related to autobi autobiographical memory over time. So how is this assessed? It's sort of complicated. So um, again, this, the, the test for episodic memory that is used is the Paired Associates Learning Test. Um, this is, again, the gold standard in assessing this aspect of aging memory response. Um, on a screen, boxes are displayed. Uh, the boxes are automatically open to reveal certain patterns, and then those patterns change over time, and the difficulty increases as you go. Once all the boxes have been opened, the, participate, the participants have to um, associate the boxes back into their respective patterns and locations. So that's why it's called paired associated learning. Um, it's uh, also sometimes called pattern recognition. So it's, um, again, um, the gold standard test for looking at this type of memory, and that's what we used in this particular trial. So what were the results? Um, again, after six months of supplementation with neurophenol, uh, we basically found that supplementate those the, the group that supplemented uh, had fewer errors. Uh, on the PAL test than the controls that were receiving a, a matched placebo. Um, interestingly, when you, this is showing quartile data. So if we actually take the study population and break them into quartile, quartiles of their memory performance baseline. So how do they perform in this test at the very beginning of the study before we even introduce the supplementation with neurophenol or placebo? If we start with that group, uh, with the group that is, um, was the lowest performing group at baseline, we see where the results really um, exist. So the, the box at the far right shows that the group, the blue bar, the group that was receiving neurophenol has you know, demonstrated significantly less errors um, in, a, in an episodic memory uh, than the placebo group after six months of supplementation. So it somewhat makes sense that among a group of healthy older adults, those that were performing worse at baseline um, had the most to gain and showed the most benefit with neurophenol supplementation. The other test I said, the secondary outcome is um, a short-term recall verbal recognition memory. Um, and this is, uh, again, short-term short -term memory and new learning. So in the, in the VRM or verbal recognition memory test, um, the subject is shown a list of words, and then they're asked to recognize the words they saw from a, a different list containing the original words plus what are called distractors. So you're, you see a list of words, then you're shown the same list with some other words added in, and you need to know which was on the which words were on the original list, um, which are the versus which are the distractors. Um, and the test is done over a period of several minutes, um, sort of quickly. So it's a measure of short-term memory and the ability to quickly recall um, this list of words. Again, the gold standard in this type of um, memory assessment with neurophenol. Supplementation, we saw results very similar to the previous, um, in which um, neurophenol supplementation resulted in better recall of words among subjects with the lowest initial performance. So both the third and fourth quartile of, of baseline performance, we saw significant improvement in the subjects that were consuming neurophenol. Again, the worst performers at the beginning of the study had the most room for improvement, and we demonstrated that improvement. Uh, with neurophenol supplementation. So really, again, remarkable results um, with a, a polyphenol extract um, over a nice, it's a very nice size study, 200 subjects over six months, but, you know, really, um, really nice results. Um, I think this is perhaps the most rem remarkable and, and sort of easiest to comprehend um, piece of data that came out of it, which is something we're, we're calling uh, cognitive age. So, if we look at the data from the neurophenol clinical trial and plot it against the population at large, uh, this is what we see. So memory tests, again, the tests we use are the gold standard in assessing memory function with age, and therefore there are you know, hundreds of studies that have used this, these same parameters in healthy and um, memory declined older adults. 
uh, that have been published or that are available, um, you know, um, in the literature or um, through the through the group that that um, the Cambridge Cognition Group that that provides this testing service. So if you take all all of the data that have been performed over numerous tests in numerous groups and plot age versus um, function, you see that line that I showed earlier, which is you know this in, this is using PAL data, so episodic memory. This is the um, this is the uh, increase in the number of errors that you would see. So an increase in cognitive decline with age. So the red line represents the the average across many, many studies. If we plot our results on that line, um, at the beginning of our trial, our subjects on average were performing um, like 83-year-olds, according to um, you know looking at the the data at large. So on average, our group of subjects were performing like 83-year-olds at baseline. Those that were supplemented with neurophenols at the end of the trial and plot their data along this line were performing like 69 year olds. So in the course of six months, the neurophenol group improved their what we're calling cognitive age by about 13 and a half years. Now, the placebo group improved somewhat by about five and a half years, which is explained by the fact that the more people do these tests, the better they get these games, these online games that we use to assess uh, performance, they get better at them over time. So there's always some improvement um, just as a, as a, you know, from, from having performed them previously. So we saw a five and a half uh, year improvement in general in the placebo group and in the in the neurophenol supplemented group an improvement of 13 and a half years. So I mean that kind of improvement in cognitive age I think is a really, really important clinical outcome um, and really remarkable. As I had said, um, I knew I would be showing a lot of data um, because, again, I'm a researcher and I wanted to illustrate the commitment that Parent Capitalations has made to research and investment um, over the past few years and particularly in the area of polyphenols. Um, and as I'm not a clinician, um, but, I, but I interact with a lot of clinicians in my role and I always hear the feedback on, you know, the real life application of our work and how it's improving outcomes in patients. So I asked um, Pam Walker, who is a um, clinician who works in the area of cognitive function, has published um, several books um, uh, looking at um, one of the books called the APO, APOE Gene Diet, uh, kind of looking at uh, genetic uh, predisposition um, for cognitive decline and what the appropriate diet and interventions can be to get outcomes. I had a conversation with um, Pam and I uh, was really blown away by some of what she shared with me, and I asked her if I could use one of her case studies for you today. So just, you know, again, not my patient. I'm not a clinician, but I'm sharing uh, what, what she had told me. So in this particular case study, she's working with a male engineer uh, by trade. He had had a lifestyle that was not great in terms of, you know, a lot of travel, poor diet while he was traveling, and had an APOE43 genotype um, and was experiencing some early aspects of Alzheimer's disease or cognitive decline. He um, couldn't draw the clock, didn't know who the uh, President of the United States was, and it's hard to not know who that is, um, and uh, was on numerous medications uh, at the point when the subject came to visit um, Pam, uh, was being treated for hypertension, GERD, on two different um, Alzheimer's medications, et cetera. Her typical approach um, is to look at the genotype and to determine from that what is, and, and again, um, there's more information in the APOE Gene Diet book and, and other places that you can learn more about this, but to look at that and understand, you know, what would be the right diet and um, prescribe for him an anti-inflammatory diet, kind of a basic anti-inflammatory diet, 2,400 calories a day, um, you know, heavy protein, wild fish, limited animal protein, plant-based plant -based fats. Um, no coffee, uh, making sure to mix protein, carbohydrate, and fat at every meal, lots of green leafy vegetables, some whole grains, but limited grains. So um, somewhat typical um, anti-inflammatory type uh, diet, um, exercise, 30 minutes of cardiovascular and strength training every day, and a basic supplement regimen that is not a one-size-fits-all. It's, it's somewhat like um, a gram of DHA omega-3. Um, a multivitamin, but also this particular subject was B12 deficient, uh, deficient in vitamin D as well. She added CoQ10, and this 
this would be a typical approach. We're actually, you know, just with diet, exercise, and, and some supplement, basic supplementation alone, um, you know, she does observe improvement in, in these subjects. Um, and, and in this particular subject, she saw some improvement um, over a period of time. Then she had the opportunity, because of looking at some of this research and, 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 and others, um, to to pursue um, some additional aspects of the of the therapy. Um, she looked at she added curcumin um, and neurophenol, the the polyphenol blend, uh, 300 milligrams of polyphenols a day, and really saw fantastic uh, further improvement. Um, now this over a period of time, but ultimately not not back to normal, but functional and and working again um, so in, in a real estate office, um, and really based on these results, she she you know con conferred to me that you know adding sort of this curcumin and neurophenol approach, she's seeing um, a lot of her patients turn the corner in a way that they weren't before. So. Um, and this is, you know, both in subjects with mild decline as well as more advanced. So at least, again, just one practitioner's experience that she shared with me and I wanted to share with you as well. So how do we um, apply all that? Um, again, our research commitment is, you know, our, our focus is to move this data, the nutrition science forward, but we're also, of course, committed to bringing the results to you as products. Um, that's what we do. Um, and the neurophenol research that I shared with you today was used to develop Karen K. Capsulation's Curcumazorb Mind, um, which contains both uh, curcumin and the neurophenol blend um, to promote mood, memory, and mental sharpness. This is you know, designed to be used to promote healthy cognitive function in older adults. It's not designed for um, dementia or, you know, we, we studied the uh, product in healthy subjects. Um, and this is used, you know, as a nutritional approach to promote um, healthy um, cognitive aging. Um, the product provides a clinical study dose of neurophenol. That's a four, full dose um, if you take the full four capsules of curcumazorb mine per day. So just to summarize a bit, what are the key takeaways? Um, there we go. Uh, the key takeaways of our research. Um, I hope I've convinced you that polyphenols are worth studying. So polyphenols and their metabolites are very attractive as potential therapeutic agents. They have a broad spectrum of, of effects. They're remarkably safe. Um, they are involved in processes associated with multiple aspects of aging and chronic disease, inflammation, oxidative stress, blood sugar. Um, as I said, they're much more than just antioxidants. Um, there are many, many epidemiological studies that speak to the benefits of, of dietary polyphenols, but we're only beginning to scratch the surface in terms of how these phytochemicals can potentially impact human health. There's lots of emerging research, and we participate in that, um, including our demonstrating specific health benefits of polyphenol compounds in specific populations. And I showed you some of our own work on insulin sensitivity in pre-diabetic subjects, as well as endothelial function in, um, in our and um, in athletes in our particular study. Um, and then I spent some time on polyphenol extract from grape and blueberry, what we call neurophenol, that over six months improved episodic and verbal recall memory in healthy subjects um, that had the lower baseline cognitive scores um, and this improvement in sort of the general cognitive age of the study subject. Um, I talked a bit about why it's important to do work on specific um, extracts and understanding their metabolites, um, bioavailability, metabolism of polyphenol extracts on specific um, in specified target populations. Um, and really, this means that there are ample opportunities for continued research. Just a little a hint at where we're going next. Um, we are working now on another polyphenol um, project, which we're calling gastrophenol, looking at the interaction of polyphenols with the microbiome and gut inflammation um, and sort of that interaction as well, which certainly we have lots of in vitro and preclinical work on that and we're moving towards a clinical study at this time. So um, I just think in, in, I'll, I'll close there, just um, closing thought, you know, what, what makes an effective supplement in general and in particular a polyphenol supplement is that the types and forms of the ingredients are appropriate for their intended use. 
um, that the dose is consistent with the scientific evidence, that the formulation is carefully developed um, based on the research. We have to focus on bioavailability of the compounds and their metabolites to ensure clinical effect. And of course, last but not least, that the manufacturer um, guarantees potency, purity, and quality um, in the product to provide you with clinical tools for your use with your patient. So I will end there, um, and thank you very much for your time. Uh, so this concludes our webinar tonight. If you do have any follow-up questions, please feel free to get in touch with us. Uh, we'll do our best to answer them. And a special thank you to Dr. Ritz for this presentation. And on behalf of Pure Encapsulations, I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time out of your evening to join us. Have a great evening. <laughs>